Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Today marks the exact day which commemorates 40 years since the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Since then, many events transpired which impacted both regional and global events. To discuss today's topic, we're joined here in the studio by Mr. Eliez El Tzafril, who is the former head of the Mossad operations in Iran and currently an affiliate with the Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC Herzliya. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Mr. Amir Javed Anfar, who is an Iran lecturer at IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader uh, understanding of the current topic. Indeed, uh, it's uh, precisely four decades since uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came back from exile to uh, lead the revolution, uh, which started a few weeks or even months earlier, but uh, uh, was uh, obviously uh, going to succeed only when he uh, came to Tehran. And uh, after the uh, first year or so of a transition period uh, with President uh, Bani Sadr and Prime Minister Bazagan, what we have um, is um, a long period of confrontation between Iran and other powers, firstly Iraq, during the uh, Iran-Iraq war, and of course the United States ever since November of 1979 and the takeover of uh, the embassy. And when one looks uh, back- The US embassy. The US embassy. Yeah. And when one looks back um, at, um, at this period, one has uh, to ask oneself, is the average Iranian better off than he or she uh, uh, was under the Shah? And is Iran as a nation, as a state, is it better off than uh, it was in the late 70s or what it could have become had it taken another path? Mr. Tzafrir, uh First of all, I appreciate you coming here again, and I would like to ask you with regard to uh, the day of the Islamic Revolution. You were at the time in the Israeli embassy in Tehran, uh, and were actually the last person or Israeli uh, national to be in Tehran and uh, leave. Uh, what was your experience uh, at that day? I was this, uh, this, at the same time because of the situation I was appointed as uh, responsible for the emergency plan and the evacuation of all the Israelis during the revolution. And I would add to what has been said before that it is uh, 40 years of growing headache to the international community. And uh, something we will elaborate about, uh, Mr. Javed Anfar, uh, being an uh, Iranian uh, by origin, you uh, was born there and grew up there. To what degree did that uh, day impact uh, Iranians, whether they agreed with the regime or did not? I think it's, it's the greatest uh, contemporary event in the history of Iran, uh, in the contemporary history of Iran. It could have been the gr one of the greatest achievements for the people of Iran and it turns out to be one of the greatest robberies in the history of Iran. People don't make a revolution to make their life worse. People make a revolution to make their lives better. The people who, the, the leaders who brought people into the streets far more than Ayatollah Khomeini were more moderate figures, such as Ayatollah Talghani, uh, such as Bazar Gans, others who talked about democracy, more equal rights for minorities, more equal rights for other people. But the revolution was stolen by, by those who wanted Iran to take a more confrontational approach at home and abroad. And I have to say that I think the, the revolution is stuck. After 40 years, today we, we, we celebrate 40 years of the, we commemorate 40 years of the Iranian revolution, but I have to say the revolution is still stuck in its first year. And that first year was about the direction that Iran wants to take. And that first year, until today, we have a small elite in the leadership led by the Supreme Leader who want to take Iran, who continue to want to take Iran on a revolutionary path, whereas the people of Iran still, like the liberals at that time, such as Mr. Bazargan and others, who uh, Mr. Oren mentioned, they want the revolution to serve Iran first. 
but the revolutionaries want to serve Islam first before Iraq. Well, Mr. Owen, uh, I'd like you to uh, uh, bring us a little bit of the sequence of events that uh, provided this uh, uh, mark in history that uh, uh, to date impacts not only the entire region, but also Israel in particular. Uh, to what degree do you think that uh, 40 years in, the fact of the matter is it's still there, and uh, even though there's been talk for years and years and years about the possible demise of this regime, it's still strong <coughs> and it's still capable to maintain its power uh, within the Iranian institutions. To what degree do you think that this is uh, a continuous of uh, events that uh, will continue for more years to come? Well, you have here two major experts uh, on Iran, uh, having uh, spent a lot of time there. I can only claim a short visit uh, some uh, two years before the uh, revolution, plus, of course, uh, learning something regarding uh, Iran's uh, history uh, before and since. Now, um, many of uh, the grievances that uh, the masses had were justified. Um, the Shah uh, had uh, approximately a quarter century of rule uh, of course, his family and himself ruled even before. But one can say that between 1953-54 and the end of his rule, he ruled uh, Iran uh, first on the bayonets of the British and the Americans uh, after the Mossadegh uh, period. And then uh, he became a megalomaniac. He um, started believing in his own power. Um, his uh, rule became corrupt. He um, uh, ousted... Uh, many of his uh, associates and confidants. Um, he had uh, Savak, uh, which of course was also foreign intelligence, uh, um, in which capacity Gezit Safrir was in touch with it, but was also internal security um, and was very harsh towards any um, signal of uh, disobedience, not uh, only violent uh, disobedience, but also dissent. And, and therefore, uh, there was also, of course, the so-called revolution of rising expectations. Whenever the Shah uh, gave some measures of democracy, the people wanted more. And in the 1970s, and especially following the oil embargo, which uh, made Iran richer, because oil um, has uh, catapulted in price, he wanted more arms, he had uh, nuclear ambitions, and eventually he brought about his downfall. And the, the greatest pity is that he managed to uh, make his own medical condition secret. He was terminally ill with cancer, but no one in the United States, in the Carter administration, knew it. And therefore, Carter... Even us. And, and even Gezit Safrir didn't know it. And therefore, uh, Carter allowed him to, uh, to go first to Egypt, then to the United States. Mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, when he died, the revolutionary regime and the United States were on a collision path. Mr. Tzafri, leading up to the day of the revolution, obviously also something that uh, Mr. Javed Anfal noted, uh, initially the people who protested were the middle class, the people that sought for a better life, that were uh, fed up with the corruption that Mr. Oren is speaking about. Middle class and, and lower class. And lower classes, of course, which uh, were the, the majority of the masses. The intellectuals a, also. A, concent a concentration of a lot of villagers who came to the cities, to Tehran and other places. Indeed. So my, my question to this is, how did Israel identify the fact that those specific people who made up the masses, uh, who demanded that revolution and successfully uh, acquired the revolution, um, how did they indicate to Israel that uh, the, the next stage will be shifting from a favorable relationship to uh, relations of animosity, which uh, still presides today. And if I may add, um, did you dare come uh, in touch with those opposition figures, or uh, did the uh, Shah monopolize all contacts with Israel? Well, in fact, uh, not only us, but everybody concerned, even the Shah, even the Savak, even Khomeini himself, Everybody was wrong about the valuation of the situation. I think that we were the less 
who were wrong about it. I mean, a few months before the great deterioration began, we met with Uri Lubrani, then our ambassador in Tehran, who admitted there are uh, problems, yes, but he uh, gave more five years to the regime to continue. Later on, he told me I didn't say five, I said three. I was ready to buy even three, but it took a, a half a year from the real beginning of the deterioration until the end of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it was not only our mistake, but at the same time, in <coughs> August 78, the New York Times came up with a, an article giving the evaluation of the CIA, giving more 15 years to the Shah to rule. So everybody was wrong about it, but what was sure that the uh, regime was corrupt, corrupt and was a, a police state. Mm -hmm. People vanished from their homes and, I mean, they were very harsh uh, dealing with opposition people. And the corruption, which was really the, the twin sister of the Shah, was at the head of this corruption. Nothing... Ashraf. Not Ashraf. Nothing, nothing went on there without her a big part in the situation. Nevertheless, the communications, as uh, per Oren's question, uh, between Israel and opposition figures, was that uh, existent at all, or uh, did uh, uh, the state of Israel at the in, time in not... Fact, in fact, it was, I, it was problematic, not only in this concern, but as well concerning a big Jewish community of 85,000 uh, Jews. I mean, yes, I mean, in, in the first place, when you are serving with a country where you are communicating and cooperating with the security service, you are not supposed to collect information mm -hmm. on this country. Well, yeah. clearly uh, that... Friendly, uh... friendly country. So it took us time, really, to try to begin to look with contact. We did very little steps in this contact when it was already too too late. Mr. Javilonfo, how do you see the the following this uh, revolution? Uh, uh, were there hopes that somehow the Islamic revolution would shift into a more positive direction and mend its fences with the West and, and try to uh, emerge into a more sophisticated country rather than what it ended up uh, uh, realizing were so many uh, situations or institutions um, kind of took over the corruption and maintained that corruption to the new regime. Maintained and increased the corruption. Uh, yes, Ayatollah Khomeini was very well aware that the people of Iran wanted to maintain good relations with everybody, which is why he allowed the invasion of the United States Embassy. Um, he realized that the Baza Bazargan, who was the first prime minister of his, uh, Iran, and uh, others uh, wanted to uh, wanted to maintain relations with the Americans, and uh, in order to have that enemy that he needed, um, he decided to allow the the attackers to remain. This wasn't the first time that the U.S. embassy was attacked. There was another one previously, two weeks after the revolution, but he ordered them all to leave <clears throat> the the premises. But this time he allowed them to stay. And uh, for Khomeini, for, for Ayatollah Khomeini, for the revolution to survive, he needed for Iran to be a revolutionary state. You need to have that revolutionary mode. So he made America into an enemy. Look, America has also done wrong things to, to, to Iran, 1953, coup, for example. But Ayatollah Khomeini supported the side that was with the Shah during that time. Ayatollah Kashani, the clergy, stood with the Shah during 1953 while Iran, well, they say that you know America toppled uh, Musatak in '53, whereas Khomeini's side, Ayatollah Kashani, sided with the Americans. But that's that's beside the point. Look, Iran needed an end. The revolution needed an enemy. Okay. So they picked the the pick, realm of the 20th have, they century. Could have, you could have kept the American embassy and you could have had a dialogue and then condemned them. But to go and overtake the embassy and then keep them hostages for 440 days and then for them then to release them. It's not that, you know, you're really looking for an enemy. And of course, afterwards, Saddam Hussein uh, took advantage of Iran, the weakness of the Iranian army, and, and decided to invade. And Ayatollah Khomeini got the, a bigger enemy that he needed.
clearly. Yeah, but you know, uh, this um, <coughs> episode of the takeover of the embassy changed history because uh, President Carter failed in the hostage release operation uh, in April of 1980. This was a major factor in his uh, loss to uh, candidate Ronald Reagan. Um, and uh, Nin- what? 1980. In 1980, uh, in later 1980. And also, also uh, the Iraqis um, thought that Iran is vulnerable uh, and they started the eight year war, the Iran-Iraq war. And of course, what happened later was that Iran started exporting the revolution to Lebanon, to uh, Amal and Hezbollah mostly, and Israel was drawn into Lebanon. So it all tied together. Israel, um, rather than being allied with Iran, and one must remember what happened uh, in the Yom Kippur War in 1973, Israel couldn't um, rely on her European uh, partners. All of the NATO countries reneged on their promises for fear of Arab embargo. Except Portugal. Portugal, uh, Portugal was the only NATO country which helped uh, the Americans in return for Israeli help in Capitol Hill, uh, in Congress, for, for uh, better relations. But Israel decided following 1973 to strike strengthen its relationship with South Africa and with Iran in order to prepare for the next contingency. And um, this was the heyday of the Iranian-Israeli security relationship, including, as we now know, the uh, development of uh, a surface-to-surface missile. This is what the so-called students found in the uh, embassy when uh, uh, they recreated the secret files of the CIA station there. And rather than be uh, allied with Iran, Israel became Iran's number two enemy, the uh, little Satan. Mr. Tzafri, how do you see this? Well, I I would say from Israeli point of view, it's important to look upon the uh, uh, behavior of the Iranians. I, I was beginning with saying this is a big and growing headache for the whole world, including Israel. Now, in, in, uh, from our point of view, the Iranians uh, are aiming at, <coughs> at Israel for two reasons. One, a real hate, extremist hate of Islamic reactionists, the Ayatollahs, against Jews and against Israel. And the second point is that they thought that uh, using Israel as a flag should be the the, me, the good means to to uh, collect the Islamic world around them and perhaps perhaps bring it back to Shia. Mm-hmm. What what is the major aim of the Iranian revolution is to turn back the role of history to the seventh century when the Shia was really the the major power. Major power. But, but, but the, one of the questions I think on the minds of everybody is that uh, Israel was selling weapons to Iran in the 80s. At the same time, Iran was supporting... Exactly. I saw the Uzis that we sold the uh, the guard of the Shah in Lebanon. In Lebanon. Mm. So, uh, we, With is, Hezbollah, beginning Hezbollah. Israel was, Iran started supporting Hezbollah in 1982. Israel was selling weapons to Iran until 1988. Why did it take so, why was Israel at the same time as Iran was helping Hezbollah selling weapons to Iran? What was the logic back then? I'm not sure this is correct. No, no, no. Uh, Mary is correct, also including the Iran Contras, but the Iran Contras was only part of, of the um, relationship, the uh, military relationship between Israel or several uh, arms manufacturers in Israel and their political supporters and Iran. Now, the logic behind it was that Iraq was considered Israel's major enemy. I- Israel, of course, destroyed the Iraqi reactor after the Iranians bombed it and failed. They did it in October of 1980, a month after the Iran-Iraq war started, and Israel came back in June of 81, and Israel feared Iraqi retaliation and the Iraqi nuclear uh, program, but also Iraq has always sent expeditionary forces 
against Israel. Because Iraq does not uh, border Israel, Iraq felt immune from an Israeli retaliation. So for Israel, it made sense, much like Israel helped the Kurds with Iranian cooperation in order to divert Iraqi resources um, away from its own um, front, Ira Israel or some in Israel, uh, such as Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, uh, thought that Israel's is interests are best served by uh, being with Iran rather than with Iraq. Mr. Of course, of course, I agree with it, as I was as well before that, head of Mossad station in Kurdistan, Iraq. Yes, but I mean, even at the beginning, after the revolution, we, and in our side, where there was this thinking that perhaps Iran will come back to sanity. Mm -hmm. And there were Iranians who came, important Iranians, who came to us to ask for help and, and promise that the idea of extremism is not against us. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this actually brings me to the question that I wanted to ask you, Mr. Jeff, what uh, Mr. Safir has noted and also uh, the points that you made and, and Mr. Oren, to what degree is this hatred perpetuated by the Islamic Revolution against Israel? And is there somewhere within uh, the Iranians now that uh, uh, there's been so much going on between the Islamic Republic and Israel is this going also to be perpetuated for future generations? Um, first of all, I don't think. I think one of the reasons, one of the one of the phenomena that we have in Iran, is that the regime is so delegitimized that if it says it's night, people say, "Well, no, it's got to be day," because there's, the regime has lied so many times. So, on the one hand, that has worked in the favor of Israel when the regime condemns Israel. Whoever the regime condemns, it actually is a kind of a compliment because because of the, the regime has such a bad... Among the intellects, but what about people. all those uh, remote villages that are not connected to the, the central hubs of Iran and not to the intellectuals? Um, it's difficult to say, but I have to, I have to quote uh, the observation of an Iranian I met in Turkey who, who put it very well. He said, look, the problem with Israel is that it's like a black box for the last... I mean, five years ago, 35 years, nobody has been to Israel. We haven't had any any objective news regarding Israel. The regime of Iran has just portrayed it as a black box. It's, so whatever they put, the regime puts inside that box, people will accept it. So there's a lot of ignorance on the one hand. There's a lot of ignorance about Israel. There's been a lot of brainwashing. Um, but uh, in terms of the hatred of Israel, I, I think there's still... I think it's safe to assume there's a lot of, uh, um, let's just say, sympathy for Palestinians simply because they're the poorer, they're the weaker side, okay? But, um, but uh, to, to, you know, from Iranian Jews, I hear that anti-Semitism is not, is not any more than it was before. And I think overwhelming majority of the people of Iran, again, you know, it's the question of uh, butter, bread and butter. I think they want to focus on Iran having good relations with everybody and... Uh, I think one of the models that they look at now actually is Mr. Erdogan, who curses at Israel if he's unhappy, but he still does business. So Iranians say, hang on a minute, why can't we do that? I have a relationship with Israel, I have an embassy in Israel, and if we don't like him, we could say we don't like them. But for us, for, for many Iranians, the, they say that the economy is the most important issue. And I think, I think in one of that, those ways, the revolution is already dead, that because people of Iran, I think, are are too sick and tired of the revolution, more because the people who have claimed the mantle of the revolution have turned out to be such corrupt thieves. Nevertheless, I those would, people that you're speaking about... I, and, would, uh, I would add, with your permission, shortly. in my opinion, about 80% of the, the Iranians, first of all, they do not hate Israel, and they want a, a complete and radical change back into sanity in Iran. So how come, against, uh, how come, Mr. Tzafrir, every time that uh, <laughs> the public is going out to protest and is trying to voice their objection to the regime, they're suppressed, they're suppressed immediately? They're how suppressed. is it possible that the masses one, cannot overwhelm one, the regime that one, apparently... One day they will succeed. For whom, Jonathan? Where is the Ayatollah Khomeini? Where is the Ayatollah Khomeini for this revolution? Who is going to, who would you, if you were living in Iran, who they, would you go to the street to get shot for? Leader. For well, who? Well, 
So there is no leader at this moment. At That's this the key leader, issue. there's nobody who energizes people to say that if you elect me as your leader, I will give you democracy. I will give you equality. There is no one. People are not going to get shot just for an abstract idea. They need a leadership. But and one, some, fi- some one 15, day they will succeed. Some 15, 20 years ago, there was a school of thought in Israel as well as in other Western countries that there could uh, rise an Iranian Lech Valenza, perhaps in the oil industry. Perhaps we will see strikes with students joining uh, uh, workers. Um, and the, the real, the real uh, factor is the armed force, whether it's the army or the Revolutionary Guards, because when the army did not open fire on the demonstrators during the Shahs last year, this made the revolutionary uh, possible. Well, uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so unfortunately I can't give uh, you more time other than a closing statement. Mr. Owen, we'll start with you. (laughs) The hatred between the Iranians and Israelis is not necessarily, uh, one should not uh, see it uh, as um, a deterministic factor. Israel and Iran can talk, perhaps through Russia. Mr. Safrir, about the timetable, you said that someday they will succeed. Do you believe that uh, this prediction will be wrongful on on the longer end or on the shorter end? I'm optimistic. I mean, years after the revolution, we were involved, including myself, together with other security forces in the West, America and others, even Egypt, try to uh, change back the situation from abroad by uh, those generals and politicians who were out. Everybody came to the conclusion that if something will happen, it will happen from the inside. In Mr. my opinion, one day they will succeed. Mr. Javid Anfo? I'm, I'm concerned that before that happens, Iran will become uninhabitable because of the drought. Soon we could see that Tehran's major airport could become unusable within the next 10 years because th- th- there are sinkholes appe- increasingly appearing in Iran's biggest city, which is Tehran. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Safril, Mr. Oren, and Mr. Javid Anfo for being here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watch TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem. <laughs>